But let me ask you this question because Seth, you kind of brought it up. Nobody got better, and like the net for that means the Nets feels like yeah. they've won. I think team. I think uh, Miami got better. Uh, yeah, I don't sure. think they got enough better for especially for how much they've locked themselves in to to you know what is what is a pretty good core, but without a lot of uh, I mean a very good core with with Lowry, uh, Jimmy Butler, and Bam Adebayo. Um, but without really the, the, the mechanisms to, to build much around that, at least for this year. Right. Maybe next year they can start to, but at that point, then, like, how old is Kyle Lowry going to be? Right. Is, you know, <laughs> Jimmy Butler is someone who's got a lot of hard miles on him, so you wonder how long that core is going to stay at a really high level, well, given the ages of the players. That's when they're going to start wearing cargo shorts. That's when you know Miami's going to be a little bit yeah. concerned. They got well it like <laughs> Well recalled. <laughs> but I, I don't think cargo shorts were ever in style in Miami. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> But so, Nate, what do you think of what Miami did with with the moves they made? Yeah, it'll be interesting because I think there are a lot of teams where it have kind of these NBA existential questions, right? Like I think they've probably, to me, moved into kind of a two A tier now in the mm-hmm. East behind Milwaukee and Brooklyn, where you know, but maybe they're higher than your Boston's and your Atlanta's. You know, if everything is clicking, obviously there's a lot of age-related risks which we talked about. But the reason I say it's kind of an existential question is, all right, let's say they're the three seed, they lose a hard-fought second-round series, and then they kind of peter out from there over the over the next few years. But you do have a 31-year-old Jimmy Butler right now that they feel like is a, a star player that they want to build around, and they have another all-star and out of bio, so they feel like they need to go for it now. Kyle Lahr is the best guy to change teams and they took pj tucker away from the bucks but you know is whatever that is right now is that you know whether it's tough second round exit against the nets i mean maybe they're you know could be a like dark horse championship contender if bam and jimmy play like they played in the 2000 playoffs so that's your question as an owner as a gm with some job security is that worth it that what's you guys answer to that question so, I think that they, that they, I don't think that's what they think they did. I think they put, I think they think they put themselves on that, that kind of that, that top seed line. And I don't agree with that. And I think the, the Lowry move was good. I think resigning Duncan Robinson was good. The one that kind of I didn't like as much was P.J. Tucker. Because I think too much of the thought process for that was taking him away from Milwaukee. And, and not enough... Uh, thought was into how it locks them into what is, I think, a thin, slow, small team. And I don't think that those are three things that, that at least in the last couple postseasons we've seen, I don't think those are three things that, that necessarily bode well for their ability to, you know, step up and spring that upset. I would have liked to see, and, you know, you get into the problem here of, okay, well, who do you mean? And that's a, that's a very good question. But I would have liked to see, you know, some, some athleticism, maybe a little more depth, couple, get three maybe lesser but playable guys in that spot instead of kind of shooting the whole mid-level, like, bullet on Tucker. Yeah, and, you know, the thing is for me with that, especially the Tucker signing, it's they're still searching for that Crowder replacement, right? Like, they tried it with Ariza last year, didn't quite pan out the way they hoped. And now it's P.J. Tucker. And now we're going to they're hoping like that's going to be the guy. And it does, just doesn't fit that mold for me. You know, it's he's a threat from the corner threes. But is he really a threat? Like how much are teams going to defend it? I think we started to see the Suns in the finals begin to leave him and, and, and things like that. Like that was the difference for Miami when they went to the finals was just how well Crowder shot it. And whether that's real or not, because the bubble, it's it's uh, we can debate that forever. But. They're still looking for that guy, and I just, but I don't know if that guy was out there this offseason. You know, maybe it was James Johnson. I don't know. Um, but, like, th- that's, that's the problem they kind of had to deal with, with filling out the roster. Well, I really like what they did defensively. They have a ton of defensive mm-hmm. versatility now with Lowry, Tucker, I and mean, uh, other than Duncan Robinson, you can get away with one weak link, like, yeah, if definitely. you're switching to, to cover up, probably not two. So, I mean, I think their profile is one of the best playoff defenses in the league, maybe the best. If I really, I haven't really gone through and done the tiers what I think teams are defensively, but you know they might be the best playoff defense. The Bucks will still be up there, yeah. obviously too. But 
so that can get you some currency. And I think they, they believe that, you know, enough of Jimmy Butler and Kyle Lowry grifting for fouls oh, right. and, and, you know, Duncan <laughs> Robinson can get hot. Like, I don't think they're going to be a great offensive team, but I, I do. The alternative path was not really an obvious one. And right. I do think that taking Tucker away from Milwaukee does hurt Milwaukee a lot just because they now no longer have the personnel to switch defensively, which they did, I thought, to pretty good effect in these playoffs.